Hey everybody, what is going on? It is Crypto Bobby, and today we're talking about security tokens. And you've probably heard a ton about security tokens recently. Um, there are some very vocal people on Twitter. There are some very vocal people on Medium, Podcast, YouTube that are saying security tokens are going to be the future and we need to hashtag tokenize the world. Well, what does that actually mean? What are security tokens? Why are they important? What are some of the valuable kind of aspects of security tokens and maybe some of the portions that aren't as as valuable or as prevalent to certain individuals today we're going to dive into all of that with rob nance who is one of the co-founders of city block capital which is in the process of creating their own security token so i think this is a really interesting conversation i had a great time recording it because rob has actually gone through the process obviously great name here uh, i'll go by bobby for today but uh Rob is in the process of creating uh, security tokens at City Block Capital, specifically venture capital related security tokens. But he has gone through the entire process of evaluating the different vendors associated with the security token space and of the entire process of issuing a token or starting to issuing a token, raising funds, things like that, that I think provide a really unique perspective that a lot of people haven't necessarily heard. And I think the commentary in this episode is great. So if you are interested in security tokens, you definitely want to watch through this entire interview to find out kind of what they are, what they're about, the good, the bad, who creates security tokens, kind of who helps to issue with the different platforms there. So a lot of good content within this discussion. And then um, outside of that, there was an issue on my end in terms of syncing the audio from my standpoint through this video. Rob's is actually fine in the video, but mine is a little bit, a little bit off. So apologies on that. Tried to fix it. Didn't necessarily work out. But I uh, appreciate you sticking with me throughout the video. The content, the audio is fantastic. Hope you enjoy that. If you like this video, throw a thumbs up. If you're interested in security tokens, let's hop into the video. Let's go. Well, thanks for taking the time to join, Rob. Really do appreciate it. If you could give a quick introduction as far as your personal background and then how you got into the blockchain and or security token space, that'd be an awesome way to get started here. Yeah, of course, uh, Bobby. Thank you for having me today. Uh, you know, I've, I've run a venture capital fund for the past three or so years. And as I was running that venture fund, the biggest um, objection I got uh, to soliciting new investors was the lockup period associated with it. So in a typical venture capital fund, your money's locked up for eight to 10 years. Um, and I had an investor approach me once and said, listen, I like you, but I don't want to marry you. I mean, the average venture fund is twice as long as the average American marriage. So they were like, that's a long time to stay committed to one thing. And so I started thinking, how can we change this? What's a better way to do this? And about that time, I saw that uh, Blockchain Capital had launched the BCAP token, uh, which was the first tokenized venture fund that existed. And I thought, this is really the future here, uh, using blockchain technology uh, to provide liquidity to illiquid assets. And so myself and my business partner uh, started down this road, maybe June of last year, and started researching how we do this. Who are the providers in the industry? Is it possible uh, you know, to, to create one of these? And, and that's the path we've been on. Um, and since then, what we've decided is that you know, we're gonna raise a venture fund that invests into um, kind of venture-backed crypto projects, um, but our fund is also gonna be tokenized. And we can get later into what that means, but um, you know, basically uh, uh, the, the fund, uh, an interest in the fund is represented by a token. Awesome. And I think right now there's there's a ton of like hype in the crypto industry. There are a lot of people that seem to be like really excited about security tokens or tokenized securities and tokenizing the world and all that good stuff. Um, just with your like best definition, what what actually is a security token for anybody who isn't really familiar with it or isn't necessarily sure about what a security token is? Sure. So think of a security token just as a digital security. So it's taking any asset that exists today. So it could be a stock, it could be a bond, it could be real estate, it could be a private equity fund, it could be a venture capital fund, uh, and using blockchain technology to provide liquidity to it. So you know, one of the issues that exists in finance in general is that if you have a large asset, um, you know, take uh, you know the Empire State Building or the Golden Gate Bridge or another iconic asset is that it's so expensive, there's very, very few buyers of it. There's very few people that actually buy that object. And because of that, it's actually worth less than it would be if 
if there were more buyers and we call that a liquidity premium. And so the idea with security tokens, right, is that we can use blockchain technology and the one, what we use most to build these today are ERC-20 tokens. Um, so we, we build it on top of ERC-20 using the smart contract technology. Um, and what that allows us to do is sell fractional interest in, in larger assets or in assets that didn't have liquidity before. And this is really important because that liquidity premium, which could be 20 to 30%, but in some assets like, assets like venture capital, it could be 30 to 60% uh, that, that that asset is discounted because of the liquidity, uh, illiquidity associated with it. Um, and we can really unlock that. And so that's a security token is nothing more than an ERC-20 token. Um, there's a few other platforms that it could be built on, uh, like NEO. Uh, but what's interesting, there's not a lot of wallets to hold NEO. So uh, we need something like uh, Ethereum, where there's lots and lots of wallets that can hold it. And, um, you know, we can build it on top of there, provide this liquidity uh, to just, you know, really everyday assets that have existed before. Sure, sure. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that people now at least are, are most familiar with is at least from like a token perspective and not necessarily cryptocurrency perspective, but from like a token perspective, the concept of a utility token or what some people are now calling consumer tokens as well. Um, sure. Would it be possible for you to talk a little bit about like maybe the difference right now, what you see as the difference between like a utility consumer token and security token? Is there any big difference there? Um in, I guess in your mind or for somebody who just isn't familiar with, with how the two are different? Yeah, so I think when you look at the blockchain ecosystem, you have to look at it like kind of like a three-legged stool. So the first part of that would be a payment token, right? So I think of a payment to token really like Bitcoin, right? Something you're using to, to transact payment for. There's really no functionality on top of that. The second leg of that stool would be utility tokens. And so utility tokens are a token that's obviously used within a network to incent certain behavior, uh, to incent people to work toward a common goal. So I think of uh, like uh, Filecoin as a great example. Sure. You have extra storage on your phone or your computer. There's a great way that you could sell that, make Filecoin for that, and then you could convert that to fiat currency. Um, the third area is a security token. And there's really no, you know, besides ERC-20, there is no like special protocol here. There, you're not developing a network. Uh, you're not really writing a white paper necessarily. You're simply, you know, uh, creating a digital asset. Um, and so the difference is, you know, in utility tokens, there's these great networks that can exist. And we're talking about using blockchain technology to decentralize many, many things. Um, an example, Filecoin like storage. Um, with a security token, all we're doing is providing liquidity to these assets by uh, having the ability to kind of chop them up into smaller sections. And then hopefully just like, on Binance or any other exchange where you trade um, utility tokens, there will be exchanges where you can go and trade security tokens. And so um, it's a really, it's, it's a neat, it's a cool concept because um, for the first time for these traditional assets, people will be able to send Bitcoin or Ethereum or Bitcoin cash and in return receive a token, which represents value in an underlying asset. Sure. Sure. And, I had sent a tweet prior to our conversation out just in regards to having this discussion today on security tokens. And I think that there are a lot of people out there right now that um, have some level of interest in security tokens because there are tokens available to trade that have some involvement, I guess, with this industry, something like Polymath or potentially T0 in the future, Ravencoin. And then it brings up the concept of, um, I think there may be a little bit of a lack of of insight for some people as far as like what the maybe the difference between primary issuance then you touched a little bit on maybe trading or exchanging these tokens on a secondary market at some point in time in the future um would you mind talking about the difference between uh a primary issuance type of platform for security tokens and maybe provide an example of what one of those might be and then talk about how that might be different from a secondary trading marketplace uh, and then maybe provide an example of what one of those might be, just so that people understand uh, what the difference is there. Sure. So when I when I think about primary issuance, right? So the 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 issuer of a security is the the person that is going out and selling it. So in that case, uh, for my fund, that's me. And in the issuance, there are platforms that help us issue that and actually write the code, uh, create the smart contract, um, and create the token. So um, right now, the really big players. In, in primary issuance would be Securitize, 
uh, Harbor and Polymath, and I'm sure people have, have kind of heard of all three. Um, Polymath actually has a utility token as part of their network, uh, which is called Poly. And when they're live and they have live projects, that will be used within the Polymath ecosystem to do things like um, KYC AML, uh, the Know Your Customer Anti-Money Laundering. So primary issuance, uh, when I go out and sell my token, uh, you know, investors send me Bitcoin, they send me Ethereum. Um, we take that, convert that to, to tokens that represent interests in our fund, and then we send them our tokens. Um, the platform that issues is the platform that helps us do that. So in our case, we're working with Securitize. Um, Harbor's another project that's out there. Then I mentioned Polymath, which, which a lot of people know. Once that token is on the market, it has to trade on an exchange, a regulated exchange. It's important to know that with security tokens, these are securities as defined by the U.S. government. Um, so for those investors in the U.S., um, these have to trade on security token exchanges. Um, security token exchanges um, don't exist yet today. Um, there's really two types of exchanges that will exist. One is a very traditional exchange. Um, that's like T0 you've heard about where people are working on. Um, the second is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. So a peer-to-peer -peer exchange is defined as not by not by having an order book. Um, AirSwap is a great example of, of what a peer-to-peer -peer exchange is, uh, or um, Open Finance is an example of another one. Um, I think Open Finance will be launching in a couple of weeks. I know that that T0 is also working on that. You know, we believe by the end of the year these exchanges will be up and running. Um, it is important to know as an investor in security tokens, if you're a U.S. citizen, that the U.S. government uh, locks up those tokens for one year from the time they're issued. So one of the downsides to security tokens is that it, it is locked up for, for a year for U.S. investors. It's, they're not locked up for non-U.S. investors. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to think about uh, you know, when, when you're making investing that, that it's not something that can be flipped in a day or a week um, and not necessarily something you'd want to flip in a day or a week, um, but that there are those restrictions around it. Sure, sure. That's, I think, a really good explanation. So I appreciate that. Um, in, in looking at so, I, you know, with 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 your case at City Block Capital, it's kind of this this tokenized, uh, you know, security token, the VC type of fund. There's a lot of other use cases out there, it seems like that people are excited about as well. Um, the VC one being one, I think, one of the primary probably top five interest uh, ones driving interest in the space. But uh, are there any other that come to mind, I guess, off the top of your head that you see or, or in, in working in this space now, probably for, for close to the past year, as far as what people are, are trying to, to create security tokens around any specific industries that, that interest you or you think are going to be very popular? Yeah, so I, I think real estate is a very interesting industry. Um, if you look, and, and I wrote a Medium post about this, that, you know, Chinese investors alone invested, you know, over the last year, kind of about $153 billion in U.S. real estate. A large portion of that sits unoccupied. In other words, it's a savings account for a lot of those investors. Um, so instead of having to buy a whole house, um, there'd be the opportunity to buy a slice of a hotel or a slice of, you know, a large building. Um, and so the opportunity I think that exists there is to take a lot of global liquidity um, and bring it into U.S. assets that a lot of uh, a lot of investors worldwide see as a kind of a safe haven, right? It's a safe place to invest. Some of the other interesting projects I see are uh, the ability to uh, a security token that represents hash power in a mining facility. So you get paid out daily based on the the production of that mining facility. I think that's a really really interesting use case. Um, we're also seeing private equity funds. So, you know, private equity funds have a 10 year life cycle. At the end, typically they go and find a buyer, but now they could tokenize their entire private equity fund, right? Which can represent things like operating businesses. And then you could own a piece of that business and that's how they could, could exit their position there. Um, so I think when you think about this ecosystem and where interesting projects will evolve, it'll be from assets that we think typically are very illiquid and very hard to sell. Gotcha. Yeah, that I think that that seems like from from everything I'm seeing too. You know, one of the big maybe selling points or kind of one of the big value adds to actually creating one of these securitized tokens is that uh, you know creating a more liquid asset that is traditionally illiquid. Outside of that, I'm curious: is there anything else that that really comes to mind? Whether it's on your side of the house as somebody who's kind of creating and issuing one of these tokens or on the side of the house of, of an investor, 
any other advantages outside of of solving some of the issues with liquidity when it comes down to either creating a security token or investing in a security token as well any other kind of big advantages you see over the traditional infrastructure that's currently available that uh, you think are, are worth mentioning as well yeah and i think access is a big one you know if you live outside of the united states and you want access to venture capital in new york city or you want access to real estate in new york city it's really hard to find those people and send them money um, when there is a robust security token ecosystem and those uh, security tokens are traded on exchange. It's very easy to then go buy that where you can send Bitcoin or Ethereum um, and exchange a token for a token that represents a different interest. So I think the ability for global investors to access markets, they've never been able to access before. Um, one of the interesting use cases that I've been talking with several people about um, is a way to provide farmers in, in third world countries uh, with money to uh, go out and, and harvest their crop. So they may go and say, okay, I'm going to sell you 20% of my yield of my crop in advance. And, you know, in exchange, they can go up front and buy equipment, buy fertilizer, buy tractors, whatever they may need. And what's hard now is it's, it's hard to get a global market for that. But if there's one thing we've seen uh, is that global investors love to package securities together. And this would be a way that someone that lives in New York or lives in, in Indiana or somewhere around the world could finance that project. So I could see a lot of nonprofits going in and helping farmers or livestock owners in, in third world countries tokenize part of their assets. Uh, and that would really allow them to gain access to a global market. So I think what we're going to do is see the world, you know, uh, quote unquote, get smaller. And it's going to get smaller because uh, these security tokens are going to allow investment in places where it was very, very hard before because there were high barriers to entry. Sure. And, and one thing I think that gets brought up quite a bit, and then maybe there's there's a, a couple of different maybe points we can dive into, but for the most part, for a lot of these security tokens, at least initially, uh, it's my understanding that they will be limited to accredited investors. But after the one year lockup, there is an opportunity, or, or in some cases, there will be an opportunity for retail investors, I guess, depending upon the exchange or the, the platform, the trading platform that these individuals might have access to, kind of with proper uh, KYC and AML requirements that retail investors would have access to exposure in some of these assets, in, in some of these security tokens after the one year uh, lockup. Is, is that correct uh, from my understanding or is that is that an in, inaccurate assumption? Yeah, so I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to get into, <laughs> into a, lot of, a lot of legal specifics. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, certainly here in the U.S., uh, for primary issuance, right, you have to be an accredited investor. Um, and, you know, as far as abroad, it just depends on the laws of, of your mm -hmm. individual country. Um, so as far as secondary issuance, um, I'm not sure, you know, if that's, if that's totally accessible to retail investors or not. Um, and I think it's going to depend on, on a number of factors. I mean, this ecosystem is still developing. Um, you know, there are no tokens trading on a secondary <laughs> exchange yet. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out. For sure, for sure. And, you know, as as you kind of continue to to participate in this new and I would say at, from from my uh, you know, from my object from my standpoint, this is like I feel like the security token industry right now is where the uh, maybe the utility token industry was like two years or so ago, kind of at the very early stages where like Ethereum and Augur and like those early on uh maybe Gollum, like those early on icos uh, and companies that were in that space where we're getting off the ground or trying to get off the ground i feel like we're kind of at that level right now is there anything from like an ecosystem standpoint or from an infrastructure standpoint that you think like really needs to be developed in this in this space for it to take off or anything that you wish that or, or hope that you'd see be developed to make your life easier, just the, the industry, the security token industry, make it better? Sure. I mean, I think uh, if I think as, a, as an ecosystem as a whole, I think it's addressing, uh, you know, what is accredited investor? I mean, I think the laws have been in place for a long time. Um, and certainly just because someone has a million dollars of net worth outside their primary residence or makes over 200K a year, does that mean that they're a sophisticated investor and can invest in, uh, you know, these type of projects? You know, that, that's the law today. And certainly mm -hmm. we're going to follow the law today. But I think as a community, the, what we should think about is, is there a better way to do this? Um, and is, is that something we should work with the SEC to do is, is how do we allow more people to participate in a way 
uh, that is safe and that people aren't getting ripped off. Um, I think that's really important. The, the second part of this to really get this to take off is institutional custody. Now, you've heard a lot about institutional custody when it comes to things like Bitcoin, um, Ethereum. It's all of what we mean when we say institutional custody is the ability for an institution um, to have a third party hold their assets, which a lot of times they're legally required to do. So if you're an endowment, a University of Chicago endowment, or you're a pension fund, um, you can't hold those assets yourself. And so you need someone else to do it. Today in the security token ecosystem, there is no one that can hold those assets. Now there's sev several people working on an institutional custody solution, um, but certainly that will allow larger investors to come into the space and participate. And that will increase the velocity, it will increase the amount of tokens that are in the ecosystem, um, which at the end of the day, I think will be a very good thing. Yeah, those are, I think, two great points. Um, and, and one, I guess one note I would have, and that's something just a general observation, I think Consensus, specifically one of their hubs, Token Foundry, is working on something pretty cool, I think, when it comes to consumer tokens uh, and initial coin offerings, not necessarily security token offerings, but on the subject of like what is an accredited investor. Um, I believe they're putting specific, almost like like levels of education or like quizzes around um, ICOs before you can invest in a token sale. If you show adequate information, basically if you show adequate understanding of and knowledge of what you're investing in um, and the reasoning behind what, what the consumer token is for, then you're able to do so, not necessarily dependent upon your net worth or your annual income, but kind of your knowledge of the space, which I think is something that would be pretty cool to see more widely adopted because I would say kind of like like you had said, most people, I believe, would tend to agree that the maybe accreditation standards for investing in the U.S. at least um, aren't always the greatest. So um, it will, will be cool to see how Consensus and Token Foundry can maybe push that forward if they can actually do anything there. And then from the custody perspective, something that I think we continue to see across the industry, whether it's like you said, Bitcoin or Ethereum or, and then obviously on the security token side of the house as well. So I'm excited to see that, uh, you know, it's kind of that, that part of the, you know, that part of the picture play out from, from your perspective, how, like I said, we're, we're at the beginning stages, but how, how widely adopted do you think like security tokens could, could really be? Is there, do you feel like there's a specific like limit or any, anything you're looking for in like the next few years? For the actual adoption of security tokens? Sure. I mean, I think that, that the, the Securities and Exchange Commission here in the U.S. has made it very clear that um, all utility tokens are really security tokens, right? And whether you agree with that or not personally, uh, they're going to have to be raised like they're security tokens in the future. Um, and and that's, I think that's an important distinction. So um, I, I, when we look at, at how that exists and, and where, where that's going to take us, um, I think what we'll see is a shift toward, you know, we'll still obviously have utility tokens and people building really fantastic projects, uh, but we'll also see a lot of, you know, big institutions that start transitioning their portfolios. Um, you know, Anthony Papliano had a really great piece the other day uh, on Medium where he basically said, listen, I think that the SEC is going to require that every security that exists today be tokenized because it allows regulators to be proactive right? Instead of reactive. So today, if someone breaks the law, right, they're an insider trader. They have to come back and trace that and find out what happened. Where in the future with digital securities, it just wouldn't allow you to make that trade, right? It just, it would say, hey, you, you know, you work in this company, you can't sell your shares uh, for whatever reason, uh, because you're not within a, a certain period. Um, so I really like, I think it's really cool the fact that, that we could be proactive in this industry. So instead of, you know, putting people in jail for doing the wrong thing, you just stop them from doing it in the first place. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think that that having that kind of technology using smart contracts and building that into tokens and token sales can solve a lot of the issues that the, the SEC is concerned about today. Um, and so I, I really think that they're going to really adopt this head on and say this is a really good thing um, and move forward. Um, I, you know, I, I think that one of the big when we talk about security tokens, where they're going um, I think that you're going to see a lot of ICO deal flow coming through security tokens. So what do I mean? You know, at BTC had a great poll out today where they were asking, hey, you know, uh, how many people are, are having trouble with deal flow now and having trouble with deal flow because venture investors and a lot of other investors are getting in the space and getting the best allocation. And last time I checked, something like 86% were saying, yeah, I'm not getting the allocations that I used to get. And so I think what you're going to see is 
instead of this process that exists today where people are part of groups and they send Ethereum to somebody and, and that one person invests on their behalf, that instead you're going to see people going through organized venture funds or organized uh, security token offerings to get these allocations as a group. So it's really going to formalize a lot of the process that exists today um, that's kind of in the dark and, and really bring a lot of light to it and, and make it professional and, and formalize it. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. It's it's been really interesting to see how the industry has evolved from like literally a year ago where you know you would there'd be an ICO that would sell it in 30 seconds and the only KYC would be sending in your ETH to an ETH address and there would be right. nothing or maybe at most there was a VPN requirement. You pop in a VPN, hey, I'm I'm Bobby from Ireland and we're good to go. So, like that that would be the only kind of restrictions and now obviously we're just we've kind of really gone down a, a different type of, of path here. So it's been interesting to see how that's panned out. And then also too, on your point of the smart contracts, I do think that, you know, a lot of times people give like Ethereum crap on maybe scaling and a lot of these other issues that are going on right now. But I do think even from like a smart contract perspective and understanding these security tokens and the lockups behind them, it seems like to me, and maybe you can comment on it too, but like the smart contracts themselves are really enabling some pretty unique features as far as like lockups on the tokens that are required by law or sending different, you know, not being able to send tokens outside, um, you know, of specific areas or, or whitelist. There's, there's a lot of cool things it seems like that are happening from a from a smart contract perspective not to say that that'll be limited to ethereum in the future but right now it's it's mostly there right and, and i think the reason it's limited to ethereum today is because that's that's where most of the wallets are right yep. i think there's other cool projects in this space uh that maybe it's better technology right where you could build a token on top of but not everyone has you know accessible wallets mm -hmm. um and so i i think that that's why ethereum's a large driver today um, it may not be in the future. There may be better solutions. But when you look at things like institutional custody, right, we come back to that issue where big investors, you know, have it, they have it for Bitcoin, they may have it for Ethereum. Um, it doesn't yet exist for security tokens. And so the fastest path is going to be whoever adopts that. So my, my theory is that in, at least in the short term, in the next four to five years, Ethereum will dominate the security token space. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, you hear a couple of terms like Polymath will use the ST20 term. Um, I think our token is what Harbor uses. Harbor, yep. Yeah. And so uh, that's really what I, I think you're going to see in the short term is most of these are going to be Ethereum based because at the end of the day, you have to remember these investors are not crypto people, right? They can understand that bringing liquidity to an illiquid asset is important and they don't really know maybe anything about the underlying technology. Uh, they just know that it's easy and that it makes sense and that it works. Um, so that makes me a little bullish on Ethereum because they're not going to be pushing going, okay, what makes this better? What makes this faster? Uh, they're just, happy that they can have liquidity in their assets. Sure. Um, and, and maybe going to that point too, are there any, would you say like drawbacks or tough sells from an investor perspective? You, you had just mentioned, you know, a lot of these people maybe aren't necessarily familiar as much with the technology, but they, but they understand the liquidity issues and things like that. Have you seen any drawbacks from people maybe interested in investing in a security token, but maybe not being, um, willing to after after considering the the positives and negatives of of the asset so i think there's two different very distinct investor groups so i'll call say crypto investors and then non-crypto investors right so um if i'm investing into uh you know blockchain startups that may be attractive to a non-crypto investor right and they may say oh it's interesting i have a token but then when you tell them okay well now you have to store this token somewhere and you have to get a wallet and you have to have a you know a private key that's a lot for them to understand. I think it's kind of like telling someone in 1988, like how to email somebody. People are like, what email? That's weird. Where today it's like a second, you know, we, we manage our inboxes and it's super easy. And I think that's where we'll get eventually. I think today that's hard for non-crypto investors. For crypto investors, I think they go, yeah, but I'm not going to get 10x, you know, this month and I can't turn around and sell this token, <laughs> right? And, and so I think part of the sale, as I talk to crypto investors, yeah, but, you know, part of what we're doing is getting those allocations that may be difficult to get today. Um, as an institution, um, and maybe it's a little bit longer time horizon, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and maybe you can't sell it the first month or the first year, uh, but if they're great projects, right, and, and we're selling them internally, they're still going to get that great return. Sure. And you had just talked a little bit, I think, about kind of about what, what you're doing. You had alluded to it a little bit earlier, but obviously City Block Capital, 
would love for you to just dive into to what um, what that is and kind of what your plans are, because I think one of the big reasons and one of the exciting reasons and I think why the content here today was was helpful, too, is because you're not just like talking about this industry. You're actually going through the process of of creating a token, issuing a token and, and building a business around it. So I think it's a unique perspective that not many people, if any, have have that type of experience with, but would love to have you talk a little bit about like what City Block Capital is and what you're building there too. Yeah, sure. So City Block Capital, you know, our belief really is that that local investors, so people that that live in an ecosystem, um, you know, I'll use New York as an example because that's where we're starting, um, know what's happening there. They know the best projects there um, and they're the most involved. So what we're doing is we're creating a platform to help managers, right, individuals, uh, launch uh, security tokens. So they may say, listen, I'm, you know, I've been a great crypto investor. Um, I've, I've gotten really great results in my portfolio, but I want to formalize this now. I, wanna, I, want, I want help raising money and issuing this token. And you know, then I'm going to do what I did before, which is invest in projects um, and go out and do that. So to start here in New York, we're focusing specifically on security tokens. And specifically on infrastructure. So the infrastructure would be the securitized, the harbor, the polymath, mm-hmm. uh, the T zeros of the world that are building the essential elements for the security token e- ecosystem to be successful. And we're working with people that are really influential uh, here in New York uh, that understand this ecosystem and really want to invest in it. Um, and so what they do is they help us uh, understand what's going on, uh, help us better understand the deal flow that they see, um, help us analyze that. Um, and then make the best make the best investments in that space. So um, our goal is to create this um, in several cities across the U.S. Um, and invest in what those cities do do best. So I think of like L.A., like esports, right? Um, and certainly there are some tokenized projects starting around esports now. Um, so we look at it as a way to get really great access to the blockchain investment ecosystem and do it at a very early stage, uh, but do it by partnering with people that that are really really the best in the industry awesome yeah that's uh i think that's a great explanation too um and I'm, I'm excited for you know for for what you guys are are building with city block i think it's a pretty pretty novel approach to vc and, and crypto related investing and i i think a really interesting use case for the security token landscape as well um and and it's going to be fun to see how you guys continue to to progress there too um Maybe as, as far as anything I didn't touch in the conversation so far, anything you want to finish off with or anything maybe I didn't touch on that you'd like to, to, to talk about for a minute here? Yeah, I, I think that the, the one thing I would say is that, that uh, what's important to remember with security tokens is that these are digital securities, um, but they can take many different forms. I think I mentioned uh, there's a company now where you can invest in, and you know, receive a, a payout from the hash power of, of a mining facility. Um, so this is not going to just take the form of like uh, buildings or, you know, uh, real estate, um, which which does sound kind of very boring, but will be an important part of this ecosystem. Um, there's a lot of very interesting ways that security tokens will take take shape. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do it, you know, do these com- legally compliant, right, including utility tokens, right, to raise them as security tokens. Um, I, again, I, I think that uh, as you mentioned, a couple people. Um, uh, talking about how we uh, define accredited investors and work through that. Um, I would really encourage those people to reach out uh, to the SEC and the Consumer Protection Financial Bureau and and work with them to say, hey, maybe we can develop a better standard. Um, And certainly, as I said, we follow all the rules and regulations that exist today, but I think there's a chance as a crypto community to kind of embrace this regulation and make it better. And I think that'll be better for everybody because I think you know, Bobby, you, you know people and I know people that don't meet that definition, but are yeah. certainly great investors. Um, and so I, I think that th- there's really an opportunity for us to to make a big impact on the financial world and the way it exists today and do it from the crypto ecosystem. Yeah, I think those are those are great points. Um, and it's it's so one of the reasons I'm so excited about, I think, security tokens and kind of this space specifically, too, is just because it is so new and so emergent. And I think, you know, people like yourself are um, I don't want to say figuring things out in the fly, but in some cases you're kind of blazing the trail here for, for other people in the future um, and, and helping to kind of put forward you know, 
proper processes, standards, regulations, things like that for this industry moving forward. And it'll be, I think, pretty awesome to look back in two, three years and see how things have progressed and 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 the mark a company like City Block Capital and some of these other security tokens um, have have made too. So it's gonna be it's gonna be fun to watch. I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, I'm excited. It's it's uh, it certainly is challenging to go through the process when no one's done it before. Very few <laughs> no, people have no done it before. No books to read about, really, or anything like that. Right, right. There's, there's no books to read about it. Uh, but um, you know, I think that that we are creating a process that will help other people go through this and it'll become easier. And as more, more primary issuance platforms come online, when Harbor comes online, when Polymath comes online, um, it's only going to help increase the access to the system as more lawyers become familiar with the process, more accountants become familiar. Um, it's going to be easier and easier to issue these, uh, issue these securities. Um, so though, why it is hard today, um, I, I do think that um, we're going to make this, this, this really easy in the future. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time today. It was it was awesome to catch up with you, uh, talk a little bit about kind of what security tokens are, um, why they might be useful, some of the you know some of the positives and negatives as well. Uh, so I really do appreciate that. Uh, thanks again, and good luck with everything at uh, at City Block Capital here. Hey, thank you, Bobby. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Have a good one.